Hello everyone, we are ESET researchers and a lot of time working with complex thread. I am Alexander Matrosov, it's mm -hmm. Eugene Rodionov. And today we're presenting about GAPS. It's a really interesting and complex bootkit. Uh, it's used many interesting tricks and exploitation. And the uh, outline of our presentation starting with the GAPS dropper and we described interesting code injection trick. Uh, with explorer.exe, uh, continue with bootkit details and uh, GAPS used really interesting technique for infection uh, volume boot record, uh, modify only one word for bytes and uh, receiving control to the shellcode. Uh, continue with GAPS payload and uh, the next it's forensic approaches and the last words of our presentation is the part which described our uh, plugin for hex race decompiler. Uh, this plugin is really helpful for uh, independent position code analysis and uh, helpful for uh, object-oriented code uh, reconstructing. Okay, starting with the GAPS dropper. Uh, GAPS dropper based on Paul Loader builder. It's, this builder is science uh, sprayed from September 2012. Uh, code is already leaked on the public and uh, uh, at this moment I know five uh, malware families which used this code for uh, distributing. And uh, this builder used really interesting uh, trick uh, for code injection. Uh, if you uh, try to analyze the samples with these uh, droppers, you can recognize power loader by these import tables. And more interesting part about the uh, dropper code injection to explorer.exe because uh, used uh, interesting arbitrary code execution in the explorer process. Uh, the first step is injecting explorer to explorer.exe some shell code on the next stage, uh, executing uh, code for privilege escalating under uh, trusted process address space, and after that, starting infecting the system process. Uh, shell code uh, have two stages. Uh, on the first stage, uh, the dropper executed on infected system uh, opens the shared section from uh, explorer.exe base name object, uh, try to open uh, one from uh, this list, and after that, uh, copy shellcode into this shared section, and shellcode uh, search uh, the window shell tray VND, and uh, um, Call the win API function get window long uh, with uh, index zero. Uh, it looks like this. And uh, the dropper calls get window long uh, on the first figure. And the next set parameter to modify uh, window related data. And after that, the next step uh, send, uh, call the send notify message for triggering the shell code. It's really interesting trick because Explorer XZ process uh, working with active user privileges and uh, uh, open for some modification under this user account. And uh, uh, some uh, security software uh, have uh, this process in whitelist and uh, uh, our shell code executed in trusted address space. And uh, on this figure, you can see the vulnerability in the explorer.exe process. It's arbitrary code execution, but it's not typical. It's not fixed, and uh, Microsoft not recognize uh, this code as vulnerability. But uh, uh, many malware already use this trick for distributing. OK. Um, Send notify message transferring control uh, to the address pointed to address in user APC dispatcher routine. This routine is hooked by uh, dropper and uh, transferring control to the next stage of shellcode execution. Uh, this stage uses ROP gadgets to jumping into shellcode memory region and bypassing the deep and ACLR, but uh, uh, on yesterday talks, Elias uh, uh, discussing about emet 40. Uh, I guess uh, it's blocked this code for executing on 86-bit systems. 
And the last step is uh, into address space uh, explorer.exe uh, executes the jump instruction with the address of the shell code. It's a call graph from a uh, reconstructed algorithm of execution shellcode. The third stage is configure the shellcode data. Next, hook the user APC dispatcher and search the rub gadgets. And other function is some uh, uh, helpers function for uh, as disassembler engine uh, gaps and power loader used hacker disassembler engine. It's open source and uh, uh, accessible for public. And uh, last stage, triggering the shellcode execution for uh, call API function, create thread with new, uh, new process of dropper, new thread with dropper, and it looks like that. Yeah. And on the right side, uh, the figure uh, described uh, restore set window long to original state after uh, shellcode is executed. Let's fix it. And we continue our talk with details about bootkit, Eugene. Thank you. Uh, so in the next uh, uh, slides, we will consider the bootkit implementation and the uh, rootkit functionality of GAPS. Uh, before we go any further, consider uh, our classification of the modern bootkits, which are based on BIOS. Uh, we are not speaking here about uh, unified extensible firmware bootkits because they have different approach. So all the bootkits so far seen in the wild may be split in two broad categories. The first one targeting MBR, master boot record, the other part infects VBR. The MBR bootkits are in self are can uh, infect MBR code as TDL4 or other widely spread bootkits does. Or on the other hand, they can modify partition table. For instance, Almasco bootkit, it creates its own uh, partition table entry, marks it as an active, and uh, writes it malicious code in this partition. But the MBR code remains there uh, untouched and uh, is not modified. So it's uh, more difficult to spot in the system this infection. Uh, the other infections, which are referred to as VBR or IPL, are uh, very interesting as well. Uh, there is an IPL code modification, which Rovnik does. It modifies the initial program loader code, uh, which is not the VBR. This is the uh, 15 sectors which are following VBR. And uh, uh, it is as well very difficult to spot. And here, uh, there is uh, another class of bootkits which modify by parameter block. And here, uh, and this is uh, where the gaps is. So the gaps modifies the BS parameter block and it leaves MBR and the IPL codes and VBR codes untouched. Our, the main purpose of the bootkit is to load a uh, malicious unsigned kernel mode driver. Uh, to achieve this, it's used rather standard approach. It starts with hooking an uh, intra 13 handler, which is used to uh, access the hard drive, to read or write the hard drive, so being able to hook this interrupt handler, the malware uh, intercepts read requests from the hard drive and modifies the following modules, uh, NTLDR, boot manager, winload, and kernel. Uh, one of the most important things to do while the bootkit loads is uh, that it should retain control between the uh, execution environment processor mode switching because uh, it starts booting at the real mode and then continues in the protected mode. So the, boot the bootkit host has to retain control because when the execution mode switching happens, the whole memory layout uh, is completely changed. And uh, <coughs> uh, the malware also patches uh, kernel and winload.exe to disable Microsoft kernel mode code signing policy protection to be able to load it assigned malicious kernel mode driver. Uh, so here is the, the graph. Uh, which depicts the process of the uh, bootkit process. It starts with hooking interrupt handler 13, and uh, then it waits until boot manager is loaded. As soon as uh, the boot manager is loaded, this routine is patched. It patches just by 
uh, modifying binary base. Uh, and here, this routine waits until the winlaw.exe is loaded. As soon as winlaw.exe is loaded, this routine is hooked in the winlaw.exe, which is in turn <coughs> is used to wait until the kernel image loaded. And the one more interesting thing to pay attention here is that uh, <coughs> this hook is triggered in the real mode, while this one is triggered in the protected mode. So patch and winlaw.exe is used to disable integrity checks for kernel and to be able to retain control after switching into protected mode. And uh, finally, when the system, when the kernel image is loaded, the UNE system routine is hooked and the malware waits until this routine uh, is executed and uh, as soon as it returns control to the bootkit, uh, the malware proceeds with loading malicious kernel mode module. Uh, some of the most interesting features of the bootkit is that it results in modifying only four bytes of the VBR. And here, at the bottom of the slide, you can see the uh, VBR layout for Microsoft uh, NTFS volume. Uh, there are three bytes. The first three bytes are instructions, which it transfers control to the VBR code. And there is a uh, bytes parameter block here, a special structure, which describes the volume uh, partition, some error strings, and the signature. So the malware modifies four bytes here, and the thing is that these bytes are, mm, might be different on different uh, installations and on different instances of the operating system. So it's uh, not straightforward to dissect this uh, modification, because on different systems, these four bytes are different. And here is the structure, uh, which describes the bytes parameter block. This structure is very specific to particular volume, and this structure is presented for NTFS volume. And the highlighted field, you can see the hidden sectors. And this is the field uh, which is modified by the bootkit. Uh, on the screenshot, you can see the layout of the VBR. So this is, this all is the VBR. The VBR code of the active partition is here. And the hidden sectors field is here. And the highlighted bytes with the red color is exactly the bytes which are patched by the malware. And we can see that uh, almost your uh, other part, the VBR code remains untouched. It's not modified. Uh, so let's uh, discuss the meaning of the hidden sectors field. At the top of this slide, there is a layout of the NTFS volume before infection. And uh, the hidden sectors provides offset from the beginning of the hard drive to the initial program loader stored on the hard drive. This offset is provided in sectors. So what happens when the system is moved? The MBR is loaded, the MBR code looks for an active partition, and the MBR code reads, uh, loads in memory the VBR of the active partition and transfers control to it. The VBR code reads uh, a few sectors starting at offset hidden sectors and transfers control to it. So what happens when the system is infected? Uh, the infected VBR contains hidden sectors which provide offset to bootkit instead to the initial program loader. And as a result, when the system is boot the next time, the VBR code loads bootkit sectors with the bootkit code instead of the initial program loader. So that's how the bootkit is triggered. As soon as the bootkit receives control, it uh, survives uh, several steps and finally loads uh, its kernel mode module, which contains the rootkit functionality. So the next slides will uh, deal with the rootkit implemented in these gaps. Uh, it is very interesting, very rich functionality. Uh, the main capabilities of the rootkits are the following. It provides the hidden storage for the payload and configuration information downloaded from CNC servers. Uh, the user mode payload injection to inject payloads into the address space of the processes. It provides the cover channel to communicate with CNC server and uh, stay under radar of uh, personal firewalls and uh, uh, network monitoring tools. And it uh, provides uh, some authentication primitives to authenticate CNC servers. 
Uh, the rootkit functionality is implemented as position independent code, which is available both for 32 and 64 bit operating systems. And here is how it is implemented. Uh, there is a global context, which is allocated at the very beginning of the initialization of the bootkit. And uh, uh, there is a hexadecimal constant, BBB, which is uh, substituted with the pointer to this global structure during the initialization. And as a result, you, we can see this, for instance, the call to open key is performed in the following way. So this variable, in fact, points to the global context which holds all the necessary data which are necessary for bootkit to run, a data, a pointer to the imported routines, uh, the uh, entry points of the exported routines by the bootkit module, by the rootkit module, sorry. Our, the position independent code consists of a set of blocks. Uh, each block uh, implements its own functionality. Uh, on the next slide, we'll describe the functionality of these blocks. Each block is, starts with the header, which describes its position in the, in the kernel multi-module. There is a procedure base. This um, integer is used to calculate the uh, entry points of the routines which are implemented within specific uh, module block. There is a next block of set to navigate through the blocks within the kernel mod module. There is a block initialization routine which initializes the block and of set to the configuration data. Uh, there are exactly 12 blocks implemented in the malware with uh, specific particular functionality. The most interesting blocks are maybe seen here. For instance, it uh, implements very rich cryptographic library. Uh, there are streaming ciphers, block ciphers, hashing algorithms, encoding algorithms, and even uh, asymmetric cryptography, which is based on the elliptic curves uh, for authenticating CNC server. It contains the hooking engine to set up hooks in kernel mod, a disassembler engine, the hidden storage implementation, uh, self-defense mechanisms uh, to prevent uh, uh, from detecting and removing the malware from the system. Uh, there is a set of blocks implementing network communication you can see here. There is a data link layer, custom data link layer, custom transport layer, which contains TCP IP protocol implementation, and the uh, protocol layer, which is a HTTP protocol. It can see in a very uh, interesting uh, payload communication interface to communicate between the user mode payload and the kernel mode component here. And the final block contains the main routine which runs the bootkit. In fact, it is a loop which just uh, connects to CNC server, requests the payload, reports to CNC server on the status of the bot, stores the payload in the configuration data and injects uh, the payloads into the processes. The first thing we will start with the discussing the hidden storage implementation. The hidden storage is a FAT32 hidden volume, uh, which is based on the source cause of the full, full FAT project. Uh, this is a our open source implementation of the FAT system for embedded devices. Uh, it is a bit modified, our full FAT system, in that is the entry of the file in the file directory table is 32 bytes, while in the conventional FAT specification is limited to 11 or 13 symbols. So as you see on this screenshot, uh, there is a uh, directory table here. We can see some modules he here, uh, the uh, payloader and, or plugins and configuration information. And it takes 32 bytes, so the conventional FAT parsing tools will not work in this case. The hidden volume itself is stored in the file, in the file system uh, with this name. This data are generated based on the configuration information of the malware. This file is, is accessible from the user mode, but if you'll try to open a handle on it for reading, uh, you will get uh, sharing violation error, what means that the malware holds a, a, an exclusive handle on this file. Another thing is that the contents of this volume is encrypted with the advanced encryption standard with 256-bit key in CBC mode, are uh, almost like in the industrial uh, of volume encryption tools. 
Here is the code uh, decompiled. Uh, the initialization value, which is used for CBC mode, is the logical block address of the uh, particular sector. So it encrypts sector per sector. And even though the same key is used for each sector, it results in different cipher text since the different uh, initialization values are used. Uh, the next slide covers the GAPS crypto library implementation. As it was mentioned, it contains very rich li uh, cryptographic primitives, uh, hashing algorithms, uh, the ciphers like RC4, uh, Randall, which is the advanced encryption standard, and it contains even the uh, custom implementation of the elliptic curve cryptography encryption scheme, El Gamal. And um, this, this uh, um, asymmetric crypt is used to uh, authenticate replies from CNC servers to prevent receiving commands and payload from the uh, uh, not authentic CNC servers. Uh, to be able to protect itself from being removed from the system, it hooks the RP machine internal device control, which is a de facto standard in the modern uh, rootkits targeting Microsoft Windows platform. It hooks the following uh, handlers and is interested in these requests. It monitors these requests to protect the MBR or VBR uh, of the system to be read or overwritten. Uh, we can see here the MBR because uh, one of the earliest modification of gaps we spotted was MBR based. And this talk uh, was concentrated mainly on the VBR because this is far more interested, interesting. And it protects its image, the kernel model on the hard drive from being overwritten. Uh, it hooks uh, the routines by uh, patching the first bytes of the routine. But the interesting thing is that it uh, tries to avoid patching the routine at the very beginning. It utilizes hacker disassembler engine to uh, disassemble the routine and uh, to skip such instructions as a node movie DIDI in the very beginning of the code, as shown here. And here is the screenshot from Windows Debugger. So we can see here that the jump instruction is placed here, not at the very beginning. So we believe it is uh, done to uh, maybe increase the stability of the infection or make the hook more difficult from being removed. And this slide is about the code injection functionality in the user mode address space of the processes. Well, it's very straightforward and quite, uh, it's not as elaborate. Uh, the buffer is allocated in the target process. This buffer is written with the malicious image and the remote thread is created, uh, which runs the loader code to load the payload, to initialize in import address table, to fix relocations, and etc. So there are four loaders. Two of them are dedicated for DLLs and two of them are dedicated to XD images. The DLL loaders are mainly deal with the payload uh, with the plugins. Uh, here is the uh, export address table of the plugin. It, it uh, exports three routines by ordinals. Uh, the ordinal one is for initializing, like here, loading. Uh, the ordinal two is for unloading plugin here. And the ordinal three is executing commands in the user mode address space. Uh, further on the slides, we will uh, see our implementation of this routine for executing commas on, uh, based on the one of the plugins, uh, which goes with gaps. Uh, the two XL loaders are, the one is very simple and straightforward. It just drops the payload in the uh, temp directory and runs the process. Uh, the second is a bit tricky. Uh, it creates a legitimate suspended process like Internet Explorer.exe or SVCHost.exe and then overrides process image with the payload image, or fixes the thread context so as to uh, EIP register points to the entry point of the new module, and then the process is resumed. 
So let's talk about the GAPS network, uh, network protocol implementation. There are two ways uh, the malware is able to communicate with CNC server. The first way is to use the plugin Overlord32 or 64, which is injected in this, let's say, host.exe. The malware tra uh, trans transmits the message uh, to be sent over the network to the plugin, and the plugin sends to the CNC server using Windows socket implementation. And the second way is to use custom protocol stack implementation based on the NDIS mini port driver, which is uh, stealthier and difficult to detect by personal firewalls and network monitoring tools. Here is the architecture of the network protocol uh, uh, implemented in GAPS. There is a data link layer implemented based on the NDIS, the custom TCP IP protocol uh, implemented in block number nine, and the protocol application layer is in HTTP protocol implemented in block number 10. And let's look how the how GAP sends the packets to the CNC server. So it is able to obtain the lowest device in the NDIS driver stack. This is a mini port adapter driver. This is the bottom, this is the most bottom device in the driver, uh, uh, driver in the driver stack. And uh, the GAPS sends packets directly to this mini port adapter driver by passing protocol drivers, uh, filter drivers, and intermediate drivers. Um, a, a lot of software, which is a security software or personal network monitoring tools, they operate at the like, filter driver or protocol layer. And therefore, uh, the malware is able to stay under the radar of these tools. Uh, definitely, the communication may be, uh, the communication of gaps to, with CNC servers may be spotted using the firewalls which are installed on gateways or uh, something, but the personal software, for instance, host intrusion uh, prevention systems will not spot this communication at all. Uh, the main capabilities of the protocol are the following. It's able to download the payload, report on the status of the bot, the payload which is run on the system, and uh, request your uh, configuration information. It uses, uh, it uh, employs HTTP protocol and sends uh, request specific data in POST method. And here is the, and here is how the message which is sent from the malware to CNC server looks like. Uh, there is a, a dynamically generated HTTP header. For instance, here we can see that the, all the fields are generated dynamically using a set of the predefined values like use region string, content disposition, content type to make it difficult to detect by using signature-based approach. And the message header, the, the uh, message starts with the message header. The header is, uh, starts with the 128 randomly generated bytes. Then it is followed by the integer, and we believe this is uh, the version of the, of the payload. And then it is followed with the 64 bytes uh, randomly generated. This is a so-called authentication string. And then the message header is followed with the request-specific data. And here is what uh, the malware receives as a reply. The message starts with the encrypted RC4K K1. And this key is encrypted using uh, uh, elliptic curve cryptography encryption scheme. So the first thing the malware does, it uh, decrypts K1 using private key, which is inst instantiated within the malware body. As soon as it obtains the K1, it decrypts the rest of the message with RC4 cipher with K1. And then checks authentication string with that one, which was sent previously here. If the string match, then that means that the data came from the authentic CNC server and the malware processes the reply. Otherwise, that means that someone is trying to uh, send fake data to the malware and it just rejects. Uh, to be able to reach CNC server, uh, the malware tries to uh, approach it in the following way. There is a second level domain name in the configuration information and a list of third level domain name prefixes listed here. And the malware runs through this list and concatenating this prefix with the second level domain name 
obtaining the main name and trying to contact C uh, CNC server using this name. If it's reachable, it stops and using this domain name to uh, communicate with CNC server. And here is uh, more um, domain names which are obtained from the other version of the malware. Uh, so there is a, a plugin which goes with gaps, which is dropped by the dropper. This is Overlord 32 or 64. Uh, this is essential part of the malware. It is injected in the let's say host.exe process, and uh, it is uh, responsible for dispatching the following request. The first, it sends and receives data from a remote host using Win circuit implementation, as was discussed before. And it, it uh, gathers information on the presence of the particular software in the system. It, uh, it is interested uh, mainly in the security-related software, the antivirus products, uh, the HIP systems, network monitoring tools, system monitoring tools. It, uh, it contains a list of hashes of names of the security products. And it runs uh, through the it obtains a list of the, all the processes running in the system, calculates hashes of their name, compares these hashes to the table it has in the configuration information, and, and in case there is a match of the particular hash, it uh, set up a specific flag. And this, uh, the, 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 these flags are sent to CNC server. And here, about the GAPS user mode payload interface, which is used to communicate between the user mode payload and the kernel mode driver. Uh, to uh, construct this uh, interface, uh, the malware modifies null.sys driver. On the left-hand side of the figure, you can see uh, how it looks like before patching. There is a driver, driver object, and the driver image in the memory. The driver unload routine points to the corresponding driver unload routine in the memory, and the handler of the device control request points to corresponding handler in the image. What happens when the malware runs in the system? It sets driver unload to null, what means that this driver is no, is, cannot be unloaded anymore. And the device control handler points to the driver unload routine instead to the, its original handler. The driver unload routine is hooked, the hook transfers control to the dispatcher code here. And here the malware decides uh, whether it should process the request on its own or transfer control to the original handler. Uh, here is the decompiled code. We can see here that the request comes from the user mode payload encrypted using RC4 cipher. So the first thing, the handler decrypts the payload request checks uh, signature to ensure that the request goes from the payload. Then uh, an appropriate handler is, is executed here. And uh, finally, the reply is encrypted again and sent to the user mode payload. And as a conclusion of this section, here is the table which summarizes some features of the most uh, widely spread, uh, widely known bootkits in the wild, and we can see that the gaps uh, is um, very advanced uh, due to its custom TCP IP uh, network stack implementation, rich crypto functionality, and the VBR infection. So in the next slides, Alexander will describe forensic approaches to GAPS. Yeah, GAPS is really interesting threat, and uh, we already researched it a few months and um, prepare some uh, special tool for forensic approaches uh, this threat because it's not so easy for uh, forensic engineers extract the hidden file system and uh, extract the files with CNC domain names and shellcode modules because uh, for extracting the hidden file system files you need to reconstruct full uh, structure of hidden file system and uh, encryption algorithm. In the last year on Ericon, we already present a hidden file system reader. It's a special tool for dumping, uh, for extracting hidden file system of most known uh, bootkits and other threads uh, which used hidden file system partition uh, or hidden containers. Uh, this tool can extract the gaps and all known bootkits. Uh, and of course this uh, tool can extract infected MBR and VBR because we have uh, 
anti-rootkit engine in this tool. Uh, how example, it's the dump of uh, gaps with MBR, but with volume boot record infection looks most interesting because uh, uh, a lot of shell code and a lot of modules. It's still already released on public and you can download for used. Uh, not with sources, but binary is for public, for free. Uh, and we continue our uh, talk with the part of uh, some C++ code reconstruction problems because it's so related with code independent uh, reconstruction problems. And uh, the last section of our talk will be uh, some plugin for uh, help to reconstruct uh, object oriented code and uh, code independent, position independent code. Uh, it's the list of some problems. Uh, the first, of course, it's object identification because it's uh, uh, working for manually uh, recognized the object and identify class layout, identify constructor, destructors, and uh, uh, reconstructing RTTI objects. And it's depend on compiler, compiler design and uh, each time you need uh, recognize how this code is compiled for this compiler. Uh, about RTTI reconstructing, uh, many words uh, already uh, presenting, presented on the last year Ericon by Igor Skaczynski from Hexrays, and we not repeat this stuff. C++ code rec reconstruction, it's not so easy, and each time it's really hard manually work, and uh, uh, if you uh, look the Stuxnet or the Flame, uh, it's uh, really big and huge code, and uh, you need to reconstruct uh, so many objects and other stuff manually. How example, it's smart pointer structure from Flame, and uh, uh, it's assembly code presented here. And after some manually work with structures, it looks like really beautiful and short. Other uh, example, it's virtual function identification. Uh, it's from uh, SpamBot Festi. Uh, you can see this code, and uh, uh, in assembly language, you need to recognize uh, the virtual method, exact virtual method, but uh, virtual table is so huge, and uh, in statically, you need to uh, uh, calculate the exact index of uh, virtual table, but sometimes it's really hard to recognize statically. So other primer with huge uh, Virtual table. Uh, it's from Ronix. Uh, RC4 uh, get buffer size. Uh, it's really short and really nice look uh, after manually work, but uh, you need this such hours to do this. Constructor identification, yeah, it looks good. But how it's, you do it manually? Uh, in our case, we used hex race decompiler and add local types uh, with C structure for each object. And uh, uh, sometimes it's working good, but sometimes we need to uh, do some uh, dynamic analysis for uh, calculate exact uh, uh, exact calls in virtual tables. Uh, with huge virtual tables, it's working not so good. How example, take this virtual table and uh, uh, manually reconstruct, uh, looks like this, we add in either C structure. It's this, this structure describes the object yeah, it's good, but you 
do this work only manually. After this, it looks like this code, it's really uh, beautiful and uh, really nice look after manually work. And the next part of our representation, uh, we present the Hex Race Code Explorer. It's a special plugin for uh, Hex Race decompiler, and uh, uh, this plugin helps for reverse engineers to do this manually work. Okay, Eugene, your move. So, in this part, uh, in, in this final section, we are going to uh, represent what we have done during the analysis because uh, analyzing gaps and other uh, complex malware such as Sox and Flame, Duku, uh, which are very, uh, which there is a lot of uh, abundance of the object oriented structures, motivated us for developing which. Uh, could uh, lower and facilitate analysis of the position independence and the object oriented code. We choose hex rays because it's very it's very handy tool for our our decompiling and uh, an analyzing reversing the code. It saves hours of work. So uh, uh, the first thing uh, which we are implemented here uh, and which really helps us uh, to approach this problem it uh, saved us many hours of manual work, is to navigate through the decompiled virtual methods, uh, as it was uh, told by Alexander on the previous slides, and to partially reconstruct object types. We mean partially because uh, the plugin uh, is not very good with the obfuscated code, but it is intended not to work with the obfuscated code, but with the code which is produced by their industrial compilers, like uh, uh, Microsoft compiler, uh, which has uh, like a C++, uh, C++ structures. And sometimes due to the semantics, it's very difficult to uh, uh, have the exact representation of the type in the C structure. So uh, before uh, presenting the plugin, here is some background of the hex race for those who are not really familiar with this uh, the compiler SDK. Uh, so, in the heart of this decompiler, there is a C tree structure, which is a syntax tree, which can be seen on this slide. Uh, for instance, the expression variable 3 uh, equals variable 2 plus variable 7 is represented in hex race in the following way. There is a node which, has, which is a C item T object of this type, and uh, there is an assignment which is equal sign addition here plus and variable two and variable seven. So this is the way how the hex rays internally represents the data. And uh, why we choose hex rays because uh, we are given access to this syntax tree. We don't have to build its own tree because hex rays do a lot of work, hard work to build from the assembly code this nice representation. Uh, this tree is built during uh, several iterations. There are nine iterations, so-called nine maturity levels. We use the final maturity level, which is ready to use, but if you need access to something, or like intermediate maturity level, you can get access to this tree at this level. So uh, the C item object, which is a node in this tree, is a base class for expression, expressions and statements in, uh, in the C language. So expression is everything what has a type. So there is a type information attached to the expression. For instance, we can see here the following expressions types. Assignment, integer, variable integer, call, which returns the integer value, and the routine, which is called here. Are you can do whatever you want with the, with the C tree structure, but you have to keep one condition. You have to uh, keep the type information consistent. I mean, for instance, if the call uh, needs word, then this routine has to return the word as well. And this uh, segment int, so these are the same. So you have to preserve the type information during, during your tra transformation, but you can transform this C tree structure as you wish. The statements, are, they may be blocks, 
uh, branching like uh, while, do, switch, return, assembly, inline. And the Hextrace provides you with the some iterators which allows you to go through this uh, C-tree structure. There is a C-tree visitor, uh, which is a base class for C-tree parent -y. And this iterator preserves the parent, the information of the parent of the node which is visited at the moment. And now let's have a look uh, uh, at the implementation of the position independence coding gaps. Uh, so we can see here that at the very beginning the buffer and kernel mode is allocated here. Then this buffer is filled with uh, some data, the pointers to the imported routines, some uh, internal routines, the configuration information, and etc. And finally, this context is used here, like this one. So what we would like to have? We would like to have a handy tool which allows us to automatically reconstruct the type, this type, based on the pointer to the instance and the initialization routine. This is the third thing. And the second thing, we would like to have a nice navigation are in the hex decompiled codes. So uh, we use the local types in IDA to represent the objects, for instance. We, are, we reverse this routine, uh, reconstructed this type, use hex trace to represent this type in this way, name the fields, so now it looks like more, uh, more easy to comprehend, more uh, easy to analyze, and uh, it saves time. And to be able to have a navigation uh, through, the, through the virtual calls, we can do it easily using the C3 structure. So if we encounter a call here, we can go down this branch and find that there is a global struct here, for instance, the pointer to the global context here. It is here and it has type struct IP thread one. Then there is a, a reference to the field at of set eight integer field, this one, prods both three, which has a type struct IP thread two three here. And finally, there is a reference at of set 12 integer as well, this hook routine, which is then is uh, casted to this type and then called. So we would like to have a nice way uh, to navigate in this function, because the decompiler, it doesn't know nothing about this function but its name, because we provided its name in the, in the previous slides. So the hook routine is this one, at of set 12. So, and it's time for a small demonstration here. Is it okay? Can I see the code? Okay, so uh, let's go to the initialization routine for block number two. This is a crypt implementation here. So uh, this is actually the object which we reconstructed manually and we can find this object here. Yes, this is what uh, was reconstructed manually so far. And uh, here we have references like the internal routines which are initialized using these values. So we pre-computed these values before and we already know uh, how it works, but we have the plugin for gaps which does it automatically. And this is fields. What, what we do is just your navigation for the convenience. We double click on this routine and we go directly here, which is, uh, uh, it's, it's very convenient. It, sa it, it saved a lot of time for, for analysis because uh, uh, the hex trace decompiler doesn't uh, uh, provide this functionality. And this is for, for instance, for a position independent code here. Uh, for instance, for object oriented code, uh, we can uh, automatically detect the virtual table and uh, fill this address with the virtual table so the navigation will be very good. So we can go, for instance, the implementation of the elliptic curve cryptography algorithm here and navigate through the routines like, as even though it is like a, a normal routines here. But in fact, it is a field in the structure. You can see it is in the field in the, in the structure of say uh, 15 hexadecimal. If 
we just display the graph, which is like a, a C3 structure for this routine. The highlight is the node which we have chosen here. So yes, there is a variable five here. And then this field is referred, so we, uh, we, we know that there is a reference to this field uh, at offset 192. We go to local types, which we know. We find this field at this offset 192 and obtain a trace either from here or we can uh, have a custom database with the addresses corresponding to the field structures to have, it, to have this navigation. Another thing that uh, saved a lot of uh, time for us too is the uh, reconstructing uh, uh, types uh, using this plugin. So uh, we would like to have something that receives as input the pointer to the instance of the object and its constructor or initialization routine. And as output, it would give us a C-like structure object representation. It can be done using hex trace plugin. For instance, to be able to do this, we have to monitor the following uh, expressions, the mmptr, which is a reference to the particular uh, offset in the structure. The IDX, this is using the I index. Memref, this is just a, a reference in some uh, address within the buffer. And uh, there are some modifiers here. For instance, the helper functions, which gives us a low byte or high byte, low word, high word, low word, high word, and etc. For instance, we can see here that there is a, a variable A2 pointer which has an offset 100, this EO control hook array, this memptr. Then there is a, an index offset here, and there is a segment of the result. So this is a constant. And let's have a demonstration, one more. for instance, for the same block. Supposing we just uh, given the, we have this type reconstructed manually, but we just, in case of ID, it will just not produce integer like this. So yes, it provides now uh, no information about the structure and we want to reconstruct it manually. So what we do, we just have a reconstruct type and have it here. Yes. So here is, we just count in the references at particular offset, find which fields are referenced and how they are referenced, and then we will build this structure, which have these fields. And then we can use this structure to uh, like rename and uh, rename the fields based on their meaning. But uh, this is very handy too, or, uh, for instance, for analysis such as uh, Flame or Stuxnet, because there is a lot of uh, object-oriented code and there is a lot of constructors. And when you just go into constructor, you see a memory allocation operator, there is a pointer to the instance, and uh, yes, uh, so this, it just saves time very convenient. So this is how it works. Yes, and uh, Alex Sandra is about to conclude our talk. Good news, Hex, Hex Race Code Explorer is the open source plugin and will be released after uh, Hex Race plugin challenge uh, on the GitHub. And uh, now we have uh, open uh, beta testing. If you want, you can call us by email and uh, we provide the binary for some feedback or feature requests. Uh, Hex Race uh, Code Explorer support 86-bit platform and ARM um, and develop it fully on C++ because uh, Hex Race SDK don't support Python and it's, it's a lot of fun with Hex Race SDK <laughs> in development process. Uh, it's
the references uh, on white papers and blog posts about the gaps. Uh, we already released a really huge 50 pages white paper about the gaps boot kit and described all tricks, all techniques used in this malware. Be smart with ESET and ESET hiring the talented reverse engineers to Monreal Lab. If you want, call us. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your attention. And if you want, provide some questions online and or after talk by Twitter, follow us. Thank you. If there are any questions. So, um, so how long did it take for your intelligence system to flag gaps? And what is it about gaps that made it um, pick up? And how long was it undetected before you all got a hold of it? Okay, uh, it's a good question. Uh, we have some uh, cloud system for uh, our uh, product, and we recognize that uh, we collecting information about boot sectors, and uh, we recognize some anomaly boot sectors and uh, collect more information and find the sample in our uh, sample system. Yeah, it's the way why we, h how we recognize this threat. How long was it in your system before you recognized a particular, I guess, get boot sector pattern that was being... I don't know this. didn't uncover uh, any other bootkeys which employs the same uh, functionality. Like the same approach. Uh, the, the, the question was uh, if we are aware of any bootkit which uh, employs the same approach. No, we didn't have to uh, boot on, on the other system to detect this uh, malware because uh, there is some uh, uh, anti-rootkit functionality which allows us to be able to uh, read the original sectors and uh, to get the to, to spot this modification on the infected system. Uh, could you repeat the question? Negative offset? Yeah. Well, uh, okay. Yes, I, I, uh, well, we don't encounter these negative offsets so far. Uh, this plugin was developed mainly for uh, object oriented structures. Sometimes, yes, we encounter, yes, so sometimes when there is a, a nested type, a, a nested object, and we are re refer this object in the, uh, using the negative offset to obtain its uh, base object. Well, w we just keep this information and try to figure out your just the uh, what is the parent of the object. Yes, please. GAPS used really mm, pretty easy uh, technique with ROP and uh, it's, it's possible to block it with EMET, yeah. Uh, Elias uh, described yesterday uh, a lot of stuff about EMET and after that I think, yes, it's blocked by EMET. So, if there is no question. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.